our our evening our evening lecture, and we are indeed being recorded. Uh, welcome everyone to our Dokomomo US Wiwa uh, evening lecture, where we are thrilled to have Dale Kutsera here pre presenting his work on Paul Hayden Kirk. Uh, most of you know about Dokomomo Wiwa. We are a preservation advocacy group. Uh, and we are thankful for the support we are getting from For Culture for sustained support to put on programs like this and, and others throughout the year. Uh, so, like I said, we're thrilled to have Dale here to come talk about Paul Hayden Kirk, certainly a signature Northwest modernist. Uh, he will give roughly a, a 45 minute talk this evening. And after the talk, we will have time for questions. So you please put your questions into the Q&A. If you're familiar with the Zoom webinar feature, it's down there. And then at the end of the, at the, end of the talk, we'll have time for about roughly 10 minutes for some question and answers. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dale. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you everybody for uh, turning out tonight for this presentation. Happy to talk about Paul Hayden Kirk. Um, I will talk about Paul Hayden Kirk at the drop of a hat, but uh, what I would like to try to address this evening is this kind of central question about why Paul Hayden Kirk. While I was researching Kirk and putting things together to write this book, often I was asked this question, why Paul Hayden Kirk? And uh, I think it was a valid question because he was uh, something of a, of a mystery to me. Uh, I had obviously heard of the name and knew a few of the, the better known works of his. He'd done the Unitarian Church and the library, the Playhouse Theater down at uh, Seattle Center. And uh, I really didn't know much more about him. And um, first off, a few thanks of my own because Four Culture also supported the uh, early research into this uh, endeavor, as did Dokomomo Wiwa, and the Society of Architectural Historians, the Marion Dean Ross chapter. I really appreciated their support and enthusiasm and encouragement. Because in asking why Paul Hayden Kirk, it does kind of beg the question, why Dale Katsara? Because I am not an architect, I grew up in Tacoma. I attended the University of Washington and studied journalism there. And I uh, moved to Los Angeles and uh, worked at the J. Paul Getty Trust in their marketing and PR department, mostly with the Getty Research Institute. And at the time, the Getty Re Research Institute was collecting a whole bunch of architectural materials and archives. And so I spent a lot of my, my daytime uh, either uh, touring the construction site of the Getty Center or publicizing the exhibitions and acquisitions of the Research Institute. And then just living in Los Angeles was something of an architectural education in and of itself. I mean, the, the city was just filled with interesting historic work that was unlike anything I had seen uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So when I got back to Seattle, I thought, well, I really would like to see some of Seattle's mid-century modern architecture. And sadly, there really wasn't much to go on. I, uh, I tried to read the books that I, the few books that were available. I, I talked to some folks uh, who knew a lot more about it than I did. And uh, the name Paul Kirk kept coming up. So here's the real reason uh, that I got attracted to researching Kirk, which is the work itself. And here's just some some slides of various projects. This is the Defoe House from 61. And you can see it's a wooden building. Uh, it's very plain and simple in its, in its design, very clean, crisp design, uh, wood, but stained, not painted. And here's the uh, Blair Kirk House. This is the third house he designed for his brother, Blair Kirk. Again, wood, very clean, very woodsy and Northwest in its materials, but also very modern in the way it uh, everything fit together. Uh, Kirk was a, very influenced by Japanese design. You'll see a lot of Japanese influences in his work. Here's the famous Dow House. There's the, uh, the central atrium and uh, this is the backyard. Uh, and here's the Gilbert House up in the Highlands. 
uh, look at that long row of clerestory windows. And of course, you can see inside how it fills the living room with light. And here's one of his series 300 houses that made the cover of Sunset Magazine. So all this work was clearly really compelling. I'd seen enough work in Los Angeles to know good architecture when I saw it. And so it was clear that Paul Kirk deserved more study and frankly, a good book. So I think that what came, his work came down to and, and how Paul Kirk kind of became Paul Kirk it boils down to three things. One was timing, one was opportunity, and third, one, obviously the key one is talent. So let's take them one at a time. Timing, I think, is pretty important in an architect's career. Really, the most important decision an architect can make is what year they're born in. And uh, here, Kirk was born in 1914 in Toole, Utah. And that was an important year, as we, will, as we will see. He moved to Seattle in 1922, had a very nice childhood in the Roaring Twenties in Seattle, attended Roosevelt High School, and then the University of Washington from 32 to 37. And here's an element of that timing issue because those years are really the absolute worst years of the Great Depression in Seattle. If Kirk had been born a little sooner, he would have gotten out of school and really hit the, the worst of the Depression a, a little later and he would have hit uh, the difficulties of World War II. Both difficult times to start a, an architectural career. But Kirk had the good fortune of being in college during the worst of these economic, economically uh, distressed years. His college career also uh, coincided with really the introduction of modernism to America. This is a picture of the famous MoMA show, the 1932 uh, MoMA show on the international style. Uh, this show actually did go on tour and did appear at the Henry Gallery at the UW uh, while Kirk was a student. So this is a very exciting time to be an architecture student. And even as uh, a lot of uh, European modernism was being brought over in these great exhibitions and magazine stories and so forth, there was a, a West Coast version of modernism as well. And, and that had bubbled up from the, the Bay Area work of William Worcester, and it had kind of taken some early, uh, early roots in Portland with the work of John Yon, and this is his Watsik house in Portland. And you can see it's, it's kind of traditional, but it's also kind of modern. There's some regularly, uh, you know, uh, there's a rhythm to the, 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 the grid pattern of the work. The wood is stained, not uh, painted, and there's these exposed, uh, exposed columns in the back, on the back side of the house. And uh, Pietro Bluski was doing something very similar. You can see there's similar columns with the, the Souter house here in Portland. And this, I believe, is the Myers house in Magnolia. And this is a house that uh, went up in 37 and saw that as a student at the UW and was very influenced by it. By it. And you can see the, the grouped windows and you can see part of the, the roof was peeled back and you can see the, the light coming through the and you'll see that in Kirk's work uh, as well. These were, these were very influential works for Paul Kirk as a student at the UW. So he had the good fortune of getting out of school uh, just as the economy was starting to pick back up again because there was a lot of rumblings about war in the Pacific and in Europe. And so the federal government was spending a lot more money on defense spending and defense worker housing. Kirk was an excellent student and he had great apprenticeships, one with Ellsworth Story. And he established his own practice in 39. And by then there was a lot of spending going on uh, related to defense uh, worker housing. And so it was actually a pretty good time to hang out a shingle and become an architect. The second factor is opportunity. And at this point in time, you might be wondering, why haven't I shown a picture of Paul Hayden Kirk yet? And that is intentional. I kind of wanted to mirror my own experience because I had been doing uh, quite a bit of, you know, just casual reading and research on Paul Kirk and really didn't even know what he looked like. And my assumption was that he looked like one of these guys. So here's a pop quiz. You can match the, the names with the photos of the architects. And this is a trick quiz because there are more names than photos and not all those photos are of architects. But this is the kind of person, a kind of 
uh, man about town, social animal that I assumed Paul Kirk was because he was working in this very dynamic, modern style. If you Google Paul Kirk, this picture often turns up and it's not Paul Kirk, even though it's often labeled that way. It is a Mohai photo. And it's telling to me that uh, even as I got into this a few years ago, whoever was cataloging this photograph didn't know what Paul Kirk looked like. And I assume that most of the clients that came into Kirk's office didn't know what he looked like until they met him. This picture will also pop up. This is taken in the early 60s when the firm was called Kirk Wallace McKinley. That's Don Wallace in the foreground. He ran the drafting room and did a lot of the contracts and supervision. Back on the phone is David McKinley. And then of course, Paul Kirk right in the center. And this, this photo is also a bit telling because it, it, uh, you'll notice that his right arm is, is blocked by the frame of the door. What is telling is that another factor that I kind of left off the table until now, which is that Paul Kirk contracted polio as a child in 1917, he was three years old, and it paralyzed his right arm and it also affected his leg. So he had some mobility issues through his life to varying degrees. But it's, uh, it's interesting to think how the polio impacted his career in, in more ways than one. So in some ways, as we'll see, the polio was something of an opportunity. Uh, and uh, we'll see that as it goes along here. The, um, the, the good side of that was that he had a very supportive family. He had a terrific, very close-knit family. There's a picture of the Kirk family. It's uh, Blair Kirk on the left, Spencer Kirk, Vine, uh, Marjorie Kirk uh, sister, and uh, then Paul on the right side. And uh, you'll notice the, the, the right arm tucked into his pocket. Uh, what's interesting here is that Spencer Kirk, uh, Kirk's father, was uh, an interior designer. And he had uh, grown up in Utah and really kind of found his calling as a furniture salesman. And that kind of matured and morphed into really designing uh, interiors for a lot of the, the wealthier people in the greater Utah area. And uh, he got a similar job here in Seattle and eventually opened up his own uh, decorating firm. And both Paul and Blair worked at that firm as kids. So growing up, Paul had some exposure to aesthetics and design and the, the, the sensibility of fabrics and textures and light and so forth. It was a very interesting uh, upbringing. And this is another great opportunity he had because the family bought some property way out in the boondocks of Lake Sammamish. And uh, they, had, uh, they would spend the weekends in the late 20s and 30s going out there and building this summer uh, cabin, a, kind of a weekend cabin for themselves. And it was probably Paul Kirk's first chance to do any real design work and building work. So Paul Kirk also benefited from good teachers. He had a good uh, middle school drafting teacher who taught him how to use weights to hold down the T-square and the triangles so that he could draw with, with his good left hand because he obviously couldn't hold those things down with his right hand. He also had a great, the great teacher, uh, Lionel Prees at the University of Washington. And because he was an excellent student, uh, he had great internships. He was, you know, one of the lucky ones that got out of school and was able to land uh, coveted jobs, you know, in the tail end of the depression uh, with various firms, including Ellsworth Story's firm. And here's where the polio did have something of an impact in the sense that he couldn't serve in World War II. So while many of his peers were, had their careers kind of, uh, uh, kind of delayed a bit by the war, war service, Paul Kirk uh, was able to just to keep his practice going. Now, granted, there wasn't a, a huge amount of really interesting work to be done uh, in, uh, during the war years, but he did, still developed a lot of great experience. And of course, Paul Kirk would probably say his, his best opportunity was just being here in the Northwest where the land and the climate are really conducive to interesting architecture. So now let's talk about talent. Here's a quote from Kirk. I can quickly come up with a solution. I'm content that it's final. I can make a rapid sketch. I throw my preliminary sketches away. It becomes mediocre. You milk it down if you analyze it too much. And I think if Paul Kirk had a philosophy, that's probably it right there. He was uh, a real 
he came up with things quickly and he was a real, uh, really creative and he did not belabor his work. He just kept moving forward. I think his talent is, is, you know, a couple of different factors here. One is that he could draw. He drew really from when he was a child, when he was three, he had, you know, those many months of convalescing from polio, basically quarantined in a room and he spent them drawing. Uh, here's some of his college university special collections it's uh terrific work and you gotta you gotta consider he's doing this all one-handed there's another one jane hastings said that paul kirk could draw faster with one hand than his fellow students could with two and here's a uh, one of his design projects and you can kind of see there's a little bit of modernism creeping in in the flat roof of this church kind of exposed columns minimal decoration Here's some of his watercolors uh, later in life after he retired. So the other part of his talent was that he was really adaptable. And I, uh, I think that's an underrated quality for someone going into any creative field. Uh, his early projects probably were set up or, or arranged, or at least the connections were made through his father, because his father had a lot of connections with local developers and uh, builders and so forth. So this is the Hubbard House. You can see clearly it's an English cottage style. It's hardly what you would think of with Paul Hayden Kirk. This is the main house here. And then there's like a guest house or, or side cottage. And the interesting part of it is the two are connected by this glass enclosed breezeway that actually is a bridge over a little brook, that a uh, little stream that goes through the property. Here's the McCurdy House. Again, Kirk was doing all these drawings himself. He was a one-man band at the time. Here's the cupola, and you can see it there on top of the house. These are really nice Beaux Arts drawings, and uh, this is if this is what the client wanted. This is what Paul Kirk was going to deliver. At the other end of the spectrum is Columbia Ridge. This was a, a defense worker housing project that was just south of the Jefferson Golf Course. And uh, Kirk designed three plans and then flopped them. So there's actually kind of six plans and he scattered them over this uh, you know, multi-block development. But they were all very more or less plain, simple uh, boxes, nothing really terribly modernist about them. You can compare them to his house, which he designed the same year. This is his house in Raven. And you can see it's very much in the Yawn and Belusky mold. This, this kind of gently pitched roof, the vertical siding, uh, wood is stained, not painted, and parts of the roof have been peeled back so that light creeps through those, um, those uh, 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 beams. And he did a few houses in this vein. This is the Thorlaxen house in uh, um, down in, um, um, I oh, can't recall off the top of my head where it's set from. Um, Laurelhurst, that's where it's from. And this is the, uh, the uh, uh, Detweiler house that's over in the Bellevue area that uh, was torn down. Uh, but you can kind of see it's very, it's very a Jan Belusky. You can see the peeled back roof here and the windows are, are set in groups in a very modern style, not really punched so much into walls as much as grouped together. Probably the most interesting project he did in the war years was a collaboration with Robert Durham and Bertram Stewart. This is the High Point School. And uh, again, even here, vertical siding, stained, very gently pitched roof, grouped windows. So the other element was that he was very uh, collaborative. He collaborated with really talented people all through his career. And the first, first one, first major collaboration with, was with James Chiarelli. Uh, Chiarelli had graduated from the UW a few years before Kirk. He had spent the war years working on the uh, Vancouver uh, Housing Authority, uh, doing um, all of the uh, housing, shopping centers, schools, malls, I mean, uh, all kinds of work for the tens of thousands of people that moved to Vancouver to work at the Kaiser Shipyards. And this is their office that they had set up. They shared this with a couple other UW grads. But you can kind of see the modernist, you know, leanings of these interlocking walls and that uh, interesting uh, kind of compressed fiber material on the roof. You'd think their first house together given their Jan Belusky roots uh, would be in that vein, but uh, it isn't. It's the Schuler House is really uh, a step apart from that 
And uh, this is a, it's a Y-shaped floor plan. And there was another Kirk design before he partnered up with Chiarelli that was a Y-shaped floor plan. And so I have a suspicion that this was mostly Kirk's work, but I'm sure that, that Chiarelli was also uh, involved. Uh, you can see it's a Y-shaped floor plan and it has probably a very, this very interesting trifecta of roof systems, a flat roof, a shed roof, and a butterfly roof. And again, the, the uh, wood is uh, stained, not painted. And you'd go down one leg of the Y to get to the front door. Inside they used, they were, there's a construction photo, they used uh, you know, radiant floor heating at the time, which is rather modern. And a lot of the interior was finished in plywood, which being this was built in Port Angeles was a, a major um, product of the region. And I just draw your attention to this header beam that runs right across that strip of windows. Because if you look at another project, the Lundberg House 47, this is a very interesting house just north of the University of Washington. The lot was considered unbuildable. So they put the house up on stilts. And it's a very magical feeling to walk into, toward the front door and into the front door because the, the, the lot just kind of drops away precipitously. So you feel like you're floating even before you get inside the house. And then once you're inside the house, you see this wonderful soaring shed roof that zooms you up and out to the great beyond. And notice there's no header beam here. They, they were using metal windows and they were hid, hid some metal support posts behind these, these windows so they kind of blended in. And that's a color photo with the two-sided fireplace, a drop ceiling. A lot of times in these Chiarelli and Kirk houses, the interior finishes were a lot more refined, I think, than what Kirk would do later. They're also doing medical clinics. This is a crown, the Crown Hill Clinic. It's still there. And uh, what's interesting about this one, to me at least, is the, the use of a very opaque facade, but it's open on either side. So light was always very important to Kirk. He wanted to get as much light inside as possible. So in the waiting room here, you'd have light coming in from two sides, and even the closet had a, had a translucent uh, back to it so that you'd have light coming through and into the closet. The hallway had uh, skylights, which were a rather unique feature at the time. And these were apparently fabricated from uh, the, the uh, b canopies from, from World War II bombers. I guess there was a lot of surplus materials they could take advantage of. So a lot of that modernism done with Chiarelli and Kirk was very, um, uh, very good. It was very well detailed. It was also nothing completely out of the ordinary. There's a lot of architects doing that work all across the country by the, uh, the late 40s. But this house he, that Kirk did for his brother Blair in 1950 was something of a leap forward, I think, for Kirk. Uh, it can be assumed because it was for his brother that Chiarelli had nothing to do with this design. And this is a house that was you know, built on a sloping lot. And you'd think that the front door would come up from the street and then go right in, which is how you know, thousands of houses in Seattle work. But, but Kirk did something different. You had to kind of come up from the side, cut across the lot, and then pass through this opening to get to the front door. And we'll see that here. You can see here's the public walkway, and then you'd cut across here to go through this portal that kind of looks like a front door, but it really isn't a front door because you can see a tree right through it. And of course, once you come through there, you reach the, um, you reach the uh, front door of the, of the dwelling. And another interesting fact is the fact that the entire inside was, was basically an open plan. The only full height walls surround the bathroom. And if you think about what, what else was going on at the time with Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth house and Philip Johnson's glass house, both of those houses were similar in the sense that they had no uh, interior walls meeting exterior walls. They just had the one enclosure for the bathroom. Here's a interesting color photo of the interior. And you can see all this wood, stained wood. This is probably something that Chiarelli never would have done. He probably would have found this a bit too rustic. Kirk initially drafted a house for his sister, Marjorie, and her husband, uh, the Flemings. And this, again, had a very interesting floor plan. And I think that Kirk benefited from being able to, to design for these siblings because he probably got away with some things that uh, a typical client would not have uh, maybe let him get away with. This, again, the only enclosure in the, in the home is the bathroom. And what's interesting is this, this side, this elevation here, 
was actually comprised of uh, a long wall of shoji screens. And these closets were on casters, so they could actually be moved. So you could actually reconfigure this strip of, uh, of the interior space into two or three year bedrooms or of varying sizes. And here you can see uh, those shoji screens and the, the dining area. And by the 1950s, Kirk was on his own. He had separated uh, in part of company with Chiarelli and set out his own shop, his own shingle. And he was really just uh, an absolute machine. I mean, the, the, the quantity and quality of the work he was doing was just, is just mind boggling. Uh, it's the Linville house. Notice the, the lack of a header beam over that piece of glass. It's a great Montgomery house, big long row of very tall clerestory windows. And inside, uh, you can see how he divided the space, the living room from the dining room with these shoji screens. And he also separated the entry from the dining room with this wood grill. Now, Kirk did not design a lot of furniture. He kind of left that up to the client, uh, but he did on occasion design these wood grills with the occasional floating cabinet. And notice the cork on the ceiling. Here's the great Rhining house from 52. This is a tri-level house, which Kirk really liked to do. And again, the, the uh, sloping lots of really benefited or really kind of allowed this kind of design where you come in on the top level, right into the living room. And you come down a half flight to the dining room and then you go down another half flight to kind of a rec room basement area. And you'll notice that the, the this kind of half part, half wall, I guess you'd say, uh, between the dining room and the lower level is left open as are the risers to the stairs. So there's a lot of communication between these three spaces. It's, it's, it's a vertical separation of space and a vertical open plan as well as a horizontal open plan. And Kirk also benefited, uh, what a great opportunity to have uh, the talented Astra Zarina work in his office in the mid fifties. She was a UW grad and uh, clearly an excellent uh, artist as well as uh, as well as an architect. And uh, her presentation drawings are just uh, stunning to behold. And Kirk basically put her to work drawing presentation drawings of almost everything he did uh, in those years. So we've seen about a little bit about how Paul Kirk became Paul Kirk. He had a mix of, of good timing and good opportunities and obviously great talent. But these, uh, these were qualities that other architects had at the time. And uh, so that does beg the question, what is it about Paul Kirk's designs that, uh, really, that really evoke such an emotional response and, and, and have really influenced a, a generation or two now of, of architects um, in the Northwest? And I think that some of that comes down to three things. One is the simplicity of his design. The other is the experience of moving through his, his buildings. And the third kind of X factor is just sheer delight. And to look at simplicity, here's a good example of it. Uh, this is a, an A-frame cabin he designed up in Squim. And obviously it's a very simple, simple open floor plan. This was a weekend summer retreat, so it was not a year round residence. So everything was open kind of with the kitchen right in the center kind of demarcated by the cabinets. And there was a little kind of balcony and room upstairs. And you can see there are some uh, kind of conceptual drawings in the archives and you can kind of see how Kirk he really took some time to work out how to do this, how to make this thing work in the most simple and effective manner. And I think that any architect will tell you that doing something simply is very difficult because you have to be very disciplined. You have to reject anything that doesn't fit into that simple idiom that you're doing. And inside, uh, you can see these big clerestory windows just flood the interior with light. There's a circular stairs that goes up to the kind of upstairs balcony area. At the end of that is a bedroom. And of course, on the first floor, they kind of crafted a little bedroom in the corner here. It's a really beautiful, uh, beautiful and well-kept uh, example of Kirk's work. You can see that the fields of wood are stained, this kind of milky green stain, and the, the structural elements then are stained a darker shade. They really stand out. So that becomes really the decoration of the whole of the whole design. Here's another example of uh, simplicity. I think uh, 
and here's it's the famous Blakely building. Uh, it's really just two volumes. It's kind of a little secretarial office manager kind of volume. And then the main volume here, which is for uh, 10 or 11 um, psychiatrists. And the perimeter on both sides has these long fences of originally multicolored plastic. So you can see again, the, the plan is very simple. This secretarial uh, volume, the entrance kind of par running parallel to this long wall of masonry wall of basalt, just a, a central double loaded corridor. It's kind of uh, opened up here in the middle for with a planter and a skylight. And then the real, you know, what Kirk said, the real pizzazz of the building was that all of these offices, of course, faced through a wall of glass onto that garden area, this garden in the wall of glass and that perimeter fence. And you can see here the wall of basalt on the south side and how it split and people would walk in. You go to a uh, one uh, waiting room or the other, which could be closed off with these shoji screens. And there's the planter and of course these offices. The original uh, fencing was this, this multicolored plastic in you know, shades of yellow and, and apricot. And uh, apparently there must have been some problem with that material because within a few years, uh, that was taken down and replaced. You can see a glimpse here of the current material, which is just opaque glass set in a very shoji screen pattern. And let's talk about experience a little bit, because this is something, you know, having gone into more than a few Kirk residences, uh, I'm really impressed with. And, and it, uh, it's something that became, it clearly was a, a deci decision that Kirk made is to have an interesting procession to the front door. With the Gilbert house, you'd park in the parking area, you'd cross this little bridge, it's kind of a kind of a symbolic moat or a little, little trench that would be, have been planted. And then you come into this garden room, which is very sparsely planted. And then you'd go underneath this, this covered canopy to the front door. And similarly with the pole house, you'd, you'd park your Corvette in the parking spot. You'd come through this opaque wall to stand on this little platform and look out over this planted area. You go down a few steps and then walk across to the front door. Clearly these exterior rooms were something that Kirk used to kind of separate the interior world of the house from this exterior world of beyond the house. He wanted to have kind of an interim space. With the Putnam house, you would uh, step under this pergola, down a few steps beside a fountain, and then all the way along this, this wall of uh, translucent glass. And then finally, you'd pass over another trench on a wooden bridge. These kind of like moats, I think, were, uh, were a favorite trick of, uh, of Kirk's. So talking now about uh, delight, and I think there's uh, a, a great example of, of a delightful space is one that everyone can go to now that the libraries are back open. There's the Magnolia Library. Again, a fairly simple idea, just a big space, essentially. Uh, topped with uh, these four lanterns to let in light from above. But the interesting thing to note, note is these, these alcoves, these little alcoves here. The original idea was that you'd have to have an, a solid wall surrounding this entire space to put the books up. Uh, but Kirk said, you know, if I did alcoves, I can fit as much square footage in these alcoves as I could if, if I just did it in the perimeter of the building. So the result is you have this perimeter of the building, which is largely glass, and even light coming up from above. And then these interesting alcoves just kind of poke out beyond the glass. They're kind of odd in the, in, is that there's a bit of, I think, uh, cognitive dissonance as you walk in because in some ways you're kind of outside when you're inside this building. And the only way to be really enclosed is to step beyond the perimeter of the building into these little enclosed alcoves with their lower roof and of course the solid walls. And the best way I can describe this is an example from Star Trek. Uh, if you're familiar with Star Trek, they had the holodecks, which were artificial environments in the ship. And so you'd have this fun cognitive dissonance every so often where a jungle, you'd be in a jungle and suddenly the, a door would materialize and open and reveal an interior where there should be no interior at all. And I get the same a bit of feeling uh, whenever I uh, walk around the Magnolia Library. And lastly, I would like to uh, offer up the Bloedel Guesthouse as a great example of, of Kirk's work and of delight. And 
clearly this is a, a very Japanese inspired design, also publicly accessible. You can walk around this when you go to the Bloedel Reserve on Bainbridge Island. And it, uh, it adjoins the, the Japanese garden on the, uh, on the site. And so Kirk clearly, you know, went all, all in, in, uh, in designing basically a little Japanese temple here. And um, it kind of incorporates a lot of his tricks and uh, simplicity of design, kind of complexity of execution though, and certainly a lot of light. You have light coming in from both sides and from this uh, full length kind of peaked skylight. And again, there's a lot of really interesting sketches and drawings in the archive for this one. You could do a whole book just in the Bloedel guest house. Uh, there's a lot of interesting studies and so forth on, on how they could handle the, uh, the wood joinery of this, uh, of this structure. And finally though, when you, when you kind of see it, when you're walking around it or inside it, if you're lucky, um, you see that there's really a, this interesting mix of simplicity of the plan, but a, a certain degree of complexity in terms of the, the structure that's all exposed and, and there for you to marvel over. Uh, of course, it has a degree of, of vertical separation as well because the, this kind of uh, living room ingle nook is a few steps below the, uh, the rest of the house with these, these side uh, corridors on either side. And of course the light coming in could be, could be closed off and muted somewhat by these uh, shoji screens. But what I'd like to leave you with uh, now is another question. And that's why not Paul Hayden Kirk? And that's a question that I asked myself a lot in the recent years as I was really struggling to put this, uh, this major project together. Uh, and uh, I, kind of felt, found myself scratching my head uh, over a few things. For starters, why wasn't a book on Kirk written a lot sooner? Why, uh, why did I have to come along and do this? Uh, it should have been done 30 years ago when Kirk was still uh, alive and could have contributed and answered a lot of interesting questions, I'm sure. And largely more on the larger, larger level, why aren't there other books on really the great uh, mid-century modernists of the Northwest. I'm shocked there isn't a book on theory. There is a small book on Terry, but not really a, a deep dive book that he deserves. He was a very productive architect. And of course, there's countless others. There's, you know, uh, Ralph Anderson and Al Bumgardner, Bassetti and Morris, Ben McAdoo. I mean, there's all kinds of really, really amazing architects that I've uh, come across their work uh, in the research on Kirk and just scratch my head over why, why isn't this person's work better known? But for that matter, why aren't there architectural exhibitions in Seattle? I was very spoiled in Los Angeles because there's the architecture community down there, the, the, the fan base of architecture buffs is very well served by new books and architectural exhibitions and lectures and home tours and so forth. Up here, not so much. It's kind of baffling because there should be architectural exhibitions. I don't think I've seen one in Seattle before. I can't recall one. And I don't know that the Seattle Art Museum even has an architecture and design curator. Uh, but Mohai or the Henry or the Sam should be involved in that. And uh, why doesn't the UW uh, Special Collections prioritize these materials? They're, it's great that they collect a lot of these materials, but they really aren't funded and staffed well enough to really uh, exploit them and make them known. Um, and I certainly encourage anybody that has a bucket of money sitting around gathering dust to consider cutting a check to UW Special Collections. Uh, why doesn't the UW Press have a UW Architecture Press? Because the, the collections uh, at the UW Libraries are so rich that you could be cranking out a couple of books a year and do that for a decade and have a really great um, uh, documentation of this of this work because, uh, you know, given, given Seattle's booming economy and given the, the rate of tearing things down and building up new, if we don't really study this work and appreciate it and honor it and, and celebrate it, we're going to lose it. So I'll get off my soapbox now. I think I actually made it in record time. Thank you for your uh, kind attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, very good. Thank you, Dale. So even though we're in the virtual environment, we'll do some applause and perhaps my meager clapping here can stand in for the bigger group. Yeah, it's fascinating work with some wonderful, wonderful imagery. And like I said, certainly a signature modernist of the of the region. 
And I'd be willing to bet that all of us in the room here share your uh, interest in expanding scholarship on modernists in the region and more publicity for the, the wonderful designers that we that we see. So I'm going to move through through some of the, the questions that have been posted in the in the Q&A here. So I'll offer them just to you here, Dale. Uh, so we have one from Amanda Clark, who would love to hear what lessons you think Kirk offers to architecture students today. Well, I, I think that uh, there's a couple of things that that uh, I think career wise that architecture students could learn from Kirk. Uh, one is uh, set up your own shop as soon as you can. I think that he was a rather, he, you know, he was a child of the, you know, he grew up around the depression. He was in college during the depression, but he, he knew that pain. And so he was a workaholic to a good degree and he was very ambitious. And I think that he, for him, it was all about setting up his own shop very quick. And I think that that's important. Being flexible is important. I think that the great thing about Kirk is that he developed his style. The style became very popular. And so he never really had to alter that, you know, what his core style was through those big boom years of the 1950s. People saw his work in magazines and they went to him to get a house that looked like a Paul Kirk house. Uh, I, so I, I, you know, the, the field of architecture has changed a lot. I had some great conversations with David McKinley about that and about how the kind of artist architect era of Paul Kirk's time kind of went away by the 1980s. Um, but I still think that there's a place for it. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the, one of the real lessons is, is get out and set up your own shop. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Well, you know, the, moving through it, another question that's been that's been asked is how do you perceive differences between houses in Los Angeles and Kirk's in the Pacific Northwest? Maybe a little discussion about modernism of the West Coast. Well, uh, I think that um, the the uh, the big difference. I'm going to try and find a slide here if I can that I was that I had worked uh, up. Um, the big difference, I think, is. Uh, the aesthetics of, of uh, a, a metal or a uh, reinforced concrete or even a wood with stucco, uh, the aesthetics of that material palette are very different from the material palette of wood. Uh, I think that when you're, when you're Neutra and you're working in stucco like that, you really are working in a, a, a kind of vocabulary of, of of solid strips and solid panels. Whereas when you're putting something together in wood, there's an inevitability that you, the person looking at it is going to realize that that is a, a, a wall that's built of wood parts. It is not one thing, it is something that's made up of several things. And it's a subtle difference, but I looked at a lot of architecture in Los Angeles and it had that very kind of uh, very interesting quality to it. And if you look at a lot of Paul Kirk's work, they almost look a little bit woodsy. It's almost like looking at the Gamble House compared to the Lovell House. You know, there's there's a woodsiness to Kirk's work that is inevitable because of the um, the the use of wood. But I also think that the use of wood is what warmed up his architecture so much. And I think that if you take uh, uh, if you use tongue and groove siding and stain it, you get this very nice medium ground between something that is a consistent material surface like a stucco and something that is very, uh, uh, you know, that is this wholeheartedly woody like, uh, like the Gamble House. Sure, certainly something to the, the assembled nature of his work of those yeah. discrete parts coming together. Great, yeah, the next question's kind of fun. Do you know if he designed any houseboats? And the question continues, in the 60s, someone almost bought one on Lake Union that was described as a Kirk-built houseboat. Well, that's interesting. I would like to know where that's at, because yes, there is a houseboat in the Kirk archives, I believe. I can't remember the name of the client, but it was a houseboat. He did design a houseboat, uh, you know, with pontoons and the whole the mm. whole yards. It did not look very, what we would consider very Kirkian, in my opinion, but uh, he did do a houseboat. Interesting. Interesting. So our next question is, uh, is uh, 
states, I've read that Paul Hayden Kirk became disillusioned with modernism later in his career and tended to move away from the post and beam forms expressed in the photos that you've shown. Uh, is that so? Uh, I don't think so, no. And there's a quote that floats around out there that you often see in Kirk's Kirk kind of dissing international style or thing. I, I've actually never found that quote in any interview I saw, so I, I didn't put it in the book because I really don't know if it's apocryphal or not. He designed the post and beam style all the way, uh, all the way through his career, uh, if you can call this kind of post and beam. Uh, later in life, he did do a lot more of uh, kind of light catcher style houses. This is in the late 60s and 70s. And he did a few of those right up into the 80s. Uh, he retired in 79 uh, and uh, did a few projects in retirement. But uh, I think his big gripe against modern architecture was in the kind of, um, uh, I don't know, the, the kind of resurgence of decoration that things you see with, uh, with uh, Michael Graves, the Portland building in Oregon and stuff like that. He really, he really did not like that building. And uh, uh, just this kind of, does a building designed from the outside in as opposed to the inside out. I think if there's a knock on Kirk's work, it sometimes, you know, a building is very simple. It's, it doesn't have a huge uh, street, you know, appeal to it. It doesn't have a huge um, impressive, you know, facade to it. That's because I really think he was designing the experience in the, the best way to really love Kirk's work is to be inside a Kirk building and to kind of experience it. Hmm. Interesting. Great. So the next question is from someone who lives in Lake Heights neighborhood in Bellevue. Uh, and this might be a little specific, asking, is there a Paul Hayden Kirk on 48th Avenue Southeast? Uh, that might be a little specific <laughs> for this on the fly, but I do know Paul Kirk had several homes over, over in Bellevue. Well, yeah, there's, a, there's a ton of homes over in Bellevue. Um, I would have to look up that particular, uh, that particular street to, sure. to see. Uh, there are a number of homes he did over there, obviously, and there's a number of spec plans that he designed that builders would take out and build. So there are some out there that I couldn't even find, but there are right. a number of them over there. Right. Very good. So we have a, another question about what was the influence of David McKinley on Kirk? In the late period of his career. Ooh, well, that's a that's a whole that's a whole lecture in and of itself. Mm. Um, McKinley was uh, uh, a very talented uh, designer, a very driven guy, and um, he, there's a lot of thought that you know I didn't really go into the bigger stuff that Kirk did in the 1960s, and he did a lot of bigger stuff. He did a lot of you know uh, buildings for college campuses. He did uh, Haggett Hall, and he did McMahon Hall and did a Gar library at the UW and Meany Theater. And there's a lot of thought that, well, McKinley was the one that kind of led the charge on some of these things and that yeah. some of these things weren't as much Kirk as you might, uh, you know, as you might think. And I, uh, I don't know that that's quite true or not. Kirk, uh, you know, I, I got a list from McKinley and McKinley kind of attributed what, what he led the charge on and what Kirk did. Uh, there's a very interesting administration building, the French administration building at Wazoo that Kirk, that McKinley said, no, that was all Kirk. Um, so there's some th build bigger things that are frankly in the brutalist manner that, uh, you know, are, I think there was even a knock against them even then, even then there was a knock against them and they were wondering, you know, has, you know, how do you translate the grace and the fun and the delight that uh, Kirk did in smaller wooden buildings to a huge building. And he would readily admit you can't, it's a whole different ball game. Whole different type of building. Interesting. And so the next question comes from knowing uh, the, or the influence that was mentioned about Japan. And the question is, did Kirk visit or travel to Japan? You know, Kirk did not. He uh, read a lot of books. He subscribed to magazines. Uh, so, so coworkers have told me uh, uh, on Japanese architecture. I think he regretted not going to Japan. There's an interview uh, later in life when he really regrets that. By by the end of his life, he was uh, had some mobility issues, and it would have been very difficult for him to have you know, gone to Japan and, and moved about uh, on a trip like that. He, it's, it's a shame he didn't do it earlier in life, but he did, uh, he did subscribe and he did really seek a lot of uh, 
a lot of the uh, aesthetics of Japan. He, he liked, for example, how Japanese houses would have the main living spaces facing a garden. And he mm. thought it was really stupid for a, a living room to have a big picture window facing out onto the, onto the driveway in the street. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes, definitely some elements that resonate, resonate through. Uh, and this one may be a little uh, subjective, but interested in well as well. What do you believe to be his best work? Wow, um, that's that's tough because he was so prolific. I think he did somewhere on five hundred houses, and he did a hundred medical mm -hmm. clinics. There is a medical clinic uh, down in Medford that I think is uh, a real jewel box. It's a real um, uh, you know it, it incorporates every trick book of Paul Kirk and, and does it in a very compact manner. I always think of that one as being a, a terrific example of his work. Um, you know, there's, you know, I think that the Lundberg house is one of the great spaces in Seattle, uh, that Chiarelli and Kirk design. I think Kirk's, one of Kirk's best designs is the series 300 house, which was, you know, a, a series, a house that could be reproduced and was reproduced, you know, mm. in numerous different places. It's a great, small, compact design. I mean, the big guns, you have to think of, you know, the Dow house and you have to think of the Defoe house down in Log Branch. Uh, there's a house, the Creelock house uh, up north is, is a, a knockout stunner. Um, there, there is, it just keeps going and going. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, um, the clinic uh, that he did, the uh, Blakely clinic is fantastic. There's a, another house, the Buckley house. That was a fantastic design. It was actually, uh, it wasn't torn down, but it was actually removed from its uh, Lake Washington lakefront, you know, lot, put on a barge and barged up to Whidbey Island instead of tearing it down. So mm. it still exists, but it, it, it exists in a different spot now. Interesting. All these designs are just fantastic. His best yeah. work is just, and there's a lot of them. So it's hard to pick out one. Right. Yeah. But as, as you mentioned, they are largely single family private dwellings where, where he made his mark. Uh, the next question is about, is there, are, are there any Kirk buildings or which Kirk buildings are publicly accessible that you might be able to recommend those in the audience being able to visit? Well, there's a, a few of them. I mean, obviously the, there's the, the bigger buildings at the University of Washington are accessible. Uh, he did a faculty club, the faculty club there with uh, Victor Steinbrook. Um, I, I don't know if it's open right now, but you can certainly walk around it. The uh, Japanese Presbyterian Church uh, in the International District is terrific, and that's a real jewel box. Uh, the Magnolia Branch Library obviously is fantastic. The, the Playhouse Theater down at the Seattle Center, he designed the Playhouse Theater and the Exhibition Hall. So that that little area right there is is really a, a little Paul Kirk environment that uh, you can go and enjoy. Um, I'm trying to think if there are, are others. Clearly, the Bloedel Reserve has the Bloedel Guest House, so mm -hmm. there are a number of them. That's that's fantastic, and we're we're seeing some great discussion in the Q and A. Some some more comments than questions. Uh, so someone mentions that they live in a Kirk home and over in Inverness, eight years living into the home. We still discover sight lines and reflections or proportions that surprise and tickle us. So I know that these many of these homes are cherished by the homeowners that that live in them. Um, certainly, a lot of what we've seen today. Yes, we've uh, you know we have lost some Kirk homes in recent years, uh, which is very sad. But uh, there are other Kirk homes that are basically passed down from one generation to the next because the, the kids who grew up with them can't bear the thought of, of selling it. So they just mm. buy it from their parents or inherit it and just keep living there. And I've had many Kirk homeowners tell me they just love walking through their homes. They love moving from space to space because it's such a really interesting, elegant experience. And of course, the light through the day is always shifting and creating new patterns uh, 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 through Clara story windows and so forth. Mm -hmm. So one other question uh, we have is what were the hopes for the Electra living model house and what of the 200 series houses? Well, uh, the Electra living house sadly is one of the houses that was torn down. I don't know if it was torn down six or eight years ago. Uh, maybe, maybe more than that, but uh, it was in Bellevue again, really fantastic one-story house and of course uh, prime real estate so that's going to be torn down and turned into a McMansion but uh, there is oddly enough you know a 
a somewhat copy of the Electra Living House that was built uh, here on this side of the lake in uh, uh, kind of near the Arboretum. And um, it was, uh, it, it gives you the impression of, of what the Electra Living House was like. Uh, that was, uh, you know, one of many kind of public programs that a magazine would put on. And for whatever reason, Kirk, you know, became kind of the the Northwest guy, whenever a national magazine was going to put on some kind of competition or, or have uh, an example of a house, they would pick architects from around the country as the Electra Living program did. And it was almost inevitable that Paul Kirk was the guy they picked from the Northwest. Mm. Um, it was a very interesting house. Yeah, great. Uh, one other the question. Other part of that question was, was what? Uh, it was about the uh, 200 series house. Oh, the 200 series. I th I think there is a street of 200 series. Yes, up up on this side of the on this side of the lake, uh, a little up north of uh, of the Ballard area. Um, mm. uh, I uh, it's hard to pin down all of the series houses because they were kind of drawn by Kirk and then handed off to uh, the builder who was kind of marketing them. And he would go around and basically sell them. And uh, in, so it's tough to kind of find where they're at because there is no address in the, in the, on the drawings and there's no real record. One of the sad things is that there's really not a lot of uh, correspondence uh, remaining from Paul Kirk's uh, you know, office or archive. I think a lot of that stuff was just thrown out when he passed. Mm -hmm. Right, great. Well, we're certainly nearing the end, and and Dale, it's been wonderful to get your 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 presentation and these answering these questions is absolutely wonderful. Uh, one of the questions is a bit of a, a softball: Who's the publisher of the book? And if we would like to order for a a retail store, well, uh, you can contact me. You can go to the paulhadenkirk.com website uh, and uh, or send me an email at info at dalecatsera.com. Um, the, uh, you know, if you go to a bookstore, they can order it through the ISBN number and the distributor will have it. Uh, it's just through Salmon Bay Books. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great. Well, as we're, we're approaching eight o'clock here, uh, I'm happy to, to stay on and, and continue our discussion. But again, I'd like to express our appreciation to Dale for spending the, the evening with us and uh, answering all our questions. Certainly a fascinating figure and it's wonderful to have your book as a, as a resource of Northwest modernism uh, moving ahead. So I'll again give you a round, round of applause. And can you Dale switch to the, the last slide there shortly in your, in your presentation? Yes, I should have had that last slide up uh, the whole time, shouldn't I? Uh, let me see here. Uh, boom. There's Paul and there's my book. All right. Great. And the, the next one with the, the Docomomo slide on it. Let me go back. Are you talking about this slide? Uh, yes, that one. So just as a, as a wrap up and a, a connection back to our work with Docomomo US WeWa. Uh, we certainly have enjoyed hosting Dale tonight, and we have another uh, upcoming lecture on another significant Northwest modernist, certainly in the spirit of Dale's uh, charge to us all to express more of the modernist work around us. Uh, we will pre be presenting on Benjamin McAdoo Jr. and the Research Collective that we've started to gather, a, a collection of, of students and scholars, activists interested in celebrating the work of Benjamin McAdoo, who was, of course, the first licensed, first black architect licensed in Washington state. So that event is coming up on October 14th. So definitely put that date on your calendars for another evening virtual lecture where we will discuss another, another modernist of the region. Great. All right. As we've, we've hit the eight o'clock button, we will go ahead and sign off. Is Eugenia, are you still there? Oops, I think you're still muted, Eugenia. Sorry, yes, I am. I've been chatting with some folks just to respond to some of their um, questions. And so, uh, but yeah, this was great. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Tyler. And um, for all of you for joining us, um, it, it was wonderful. And I, so I put in the chat, uh, we are gonna have this 
we've been rec uh, there's gonna be a link to the recording um, we're gonna post it on our website somewhere and also probably post it on Facebook as well so but you can also email us directly and we can send you the link um, directly as well so thank you sounds great all right have a good evening everyone thank you again Dale I'll just save the chat. Yeah, that would be great. I tried to make it through most of the questions. There were quite a few, but tried to pick some of the, the good ones. Yeah, they're great. Looks like there might be some people still on. So. <laughs> yeah, and some great to get some of the recollections that were coming through as well. Yeah, definitely. Back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks, Eugenia.